all you sisters. Black butterflies. All of you black butterflies.
boy recording. <laughs>
I do a little bit of touring of the country. Obviously, everywhere I go, I'm photographing things. In Suriname, I was visiting my friend Dana, who has started an organization to help um, mainly Afro-Surinamese people do research about their genealogy. So during that time, I helped her with the organization of a artistic event. Um, she did a symposium on genealogical research, which included an art show. So I helped her with that, and this is um, some art from the interior part of Suriname, um, just celebrating their um, freedom fighters um, and artists who have um, made a contribution to revolutionary thought and action. Um, so also sort of supporting local artists in this show about Suriname's identity. Um, I also made friends with random people. This guy was like, why are you taking pictures of everything? So I just took a picture of <laughs> And he was so tickled that that ended all questions. So I'll give you some insight into my, <laughs> into my research techniques. Sometimes it don't even need a conversation. Just take the pictures. People just want to be included. Right? Um, so he was happy. Um, I also met with um, cultural organizations. This doesn't, this isn't a little lighter. But I met with cultural organizations um, to find out what they were doing in Suriname. They were also key in helping me to better understand um, certain components of my research, which I'll get into momentarily. So this woman is actually uh, pinning or tying an anisa. You can see it on her head, like Nigerian women wear um, the, um, or what they call the minute foulards, and you wrap them and then you pin them. So they're really extravagant you know, shapes and sizes, very fancy. So she, there's an art to pinning them, um, and she was doing that. Um, I, I also make sure that when I'm there, I look for um, evidence of cultural connectivity. So you see they have things like, you know, the hanging bottles, bottle trees. We also see those in the South. Um, so they're part of US. Um, uh, the area that my family is from, South Carolina, is also very famous for the bottle trees. Usually the bottles are blue. But um, it's also something that you see in Benin. So many buildings you'll see on the back side of the building, you'll see a bottle hanging. The bottle typically has something in it. It's closed with wax and it's sort of hanging from the top. You don't touch it, right? Because it is um, uh, there to support the protection of the home and the family. But again, just this phenomenon of the hanging bottles was something that I saw throughout the diaspora. Um, this is a tom tom tree. Um, so it is <coughs> this really tall tree. It towers over all the trees in the forest. Um, it has a spiritual significance both in Suriname and in parts of uh, in West Africa, which is the only place that I can speak about because that's the only place that I've been. Um, it is some, a place where people would hold spiritual ceremonies. They would lay offerings at the foot of the um, palm palm tree, and they would also use it as a potamitan, which is something that um, spiritual practitioners will dance around, you know, and use as sort of the center of their prayer prayer practice. Okay. So um, the interesting thing about the tom tom tree in Suriname was for a time, many plantation owners, if they found it, they would cut it down because they recognized that mm. it's power, mm -hmm. the um, strength that it was giving to the enslaved people. Um, so I always make sure that I seek out information about things like that so that I can illustrate the interconnectedness of our culture. Right. So many, so often, you know, we all get irritated hearing people say, oh, black people in America don't have anything to do with Africa. They're not real Africans. They're not whatever. But the fact of the matter is there are so many components of our culture that are still so strong and so evident. Yes. Um, yes. And people don't really, people are typically very visual. Mm -hmm. They don't know until they see them. Mm -hmm. So it's my, you know, my responsibility as somebody who's traveling to go take the photos and then come back and talk about it. All right. And I'm getting better about that. But. Good. Thank you. Um, we saw things like cacao trees and um, you know, and we had to walk out into the forest a significant wow. way, um, and it was beautiful, just really overgrown and lush and green, and rain cats and dogs, but dried up relatively quickly. You know, the ground absorbed everything, and um, we were on our way to this uh, blessed spring. You drink the water; it's almost like tea. The roots of the trees make it into this like tea, and it still tastes very. Fresh-ish, but um, but it was it was very interesting. So we're on our way there. We had also just come from a um, burial 
ground for enslaved Africans who were on plantations run by Jewish people mm -hmm. who um, came to Suriname and they set up a number of plantations, I guess the plantation owners. Um, I've read different accounts, but it's my understanding that um, some plantation owners attracted them to Suriname because of the economic opportunities associated with slavery and plantation life. Um, and then they started opening up their own plantations. They were like, "Oh, well, we're gonna be self-sufficient, and we're gonna we're gonna open up, and we're gonna enslave our own people." Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm sorry, we're gonna enslave our own no. set of people, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> so they had obviously different burial grounds, and I, so I went to the um, burial ground of the enslaved Africans, which is very very difficult to get to. You have to take this boat and. It's, it, it's not easy. It's not easy to get there. There's no bridge. There's very few people who go there. It's totally overgrown. But, um, but those graves are still there. The interesting thing about them is that um, at the tops of the graves, they have Adinkra symbols. Mm -hmm. So um, that was one way to sort of illustrate the fact that the people who were there were of a certain consciousness. Um, so this is a wider shot of the graves. So. Um, the other thing, so the graveyard was particularly interesting to me because the focus of my research is the memorialization and funerary practices of people of the West African diaspora. Um, so I had to narrow it down to the West African diaspora. The cool thing about my trip to Suriname is it helped me to round out my research even more because um, many people who, so I started um, really consciously doing, carrying out the research when I was in Benin. I see. So um, from Benin, I also did a significant amount of research in Haiti. M much of the, or many of the people who are in Haiti came from Benin. So it's my understanding that the majority of the people who are in Haiti, Haiti now are of Beninese descent, which is an interesting connection because I didn't know that before. I didn't know that Fully, I knew that there were some Beninese people in Haiti, but I didn't realize that the prevalence of this um, population. So, um, turns out, a significant population of people in Suriname are from Benin, wow. came from Benin. So, um, Surinamese, many African Surinamese can trace their roots back to Benin. Um, so that helped me round out my research and really um, <coughs> clear, more clearly define it. So now. Um, let me tell you how good God is. Mm. I was getting a massage from this woman who um, I told, I shared with her information about my research. And she was like, oh, well, you know, I have a friend that's a funeral director, and wow. I have to go see him tomorrow. Wow. Do you want to come with me? And I was like, okay. <laughs> so um, I went with her, and turns out that there were only two or three um, funeral directors that people of uh, that maroon people will allow to carry out their funerary pro processes. So all of the embalming, even from um, picking up the body and embalming and preparing the body. And um, if folks are in the city area and they have to come to the interior, there are only two or three that are really allowed to care for their dead. And this guy happened to be one of the main ones. So he invited me into his workshop, which is where we went, and he showed me um, some of the coffins. And um, the, uh, let's see, I'm trying to make it lighter. Um, at the bottom, you might be able to see that um, there's two different coffins pictured here. There's one that's sort of the flat, sort of traditional type of coffin. I don't know how well you can see it, but sort of flat, traditional type of coffin. Mm -hmm. And then there's another one at the bottom, and it has a pyramid at the top. Mm -hmm. And this is a traditional maroon coffin. Mm -hmm. So, um, and Tracy, that, yes. that, I see the I can see it better right on your laptop. So you might want to turn that around. So oh, and then hopefully when I advance, that. you can see it. Wow. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, the, it's interesting because it has a pyramid at the top. Wow. Um, and he told me that the folks who, and, and also the, the end of it tapers, so it as actually like in the shape of your feet, you know, which I thought also was very interesting. Um, 
he said that tr the this is for a maroon person who was actually accepted Christianity, which was interesting to me because I never thought about that. I thought maroon, most maroon people had ab abandoned all of those sort of Western ideals, but some accepted Christianity. So he said traditionally, um, the coffin is c closed with fabric. Um, it's closed, it's bound with fabric, and then you put more fabric to carry it. So, um, but this has these handles, right? Um, but yes, the dome top, they put possessions in the co coffin with the person that they're burying. Mm -hmm. Sound familiar? Mm -hmm. Right? Um, <coughs> that's another shot of the coffin. And this is the workshop where they're being made, right? So um, this, the man who owns this place makes the coffins. He does everything from when you go pick up the body and get the death certificate to um, carrying out the funeral and um, arranging for the burial. Everything. Mm, wow. That's everything. Cool. So he's very trusted, very well respected. He has a very high and respected position um, amongst this community. Um, and it's all a family run, family owned business. Right? And they won't allow anybody else, meaning anybody not of African Surinamese descent to take care of these um, needs. So, so this is the family. Tracy, who, sorry? What, uh, what did he say, if anything, about the pyramid as a part? Well, so the, this is um, one of the challenges of research. A, my research isn't complete. When I asked him about, um, um, and B, we have to be careful because of people's biases. So when I asked him about the pyramid, he was like, oh, it's just so they could fit the stuff in it. And I was like, I suspect that there's more to that. Mm -hmm. And so that's phase two of my research, because again, my research is complete. He also, um, in a number of instances, when I was asking him about the difference between Christian maroon burials and um, in, uh, traditional maroon or classical maroon burials, um, he often used the word heathens. Well, if you're a heathen, you had this, but if you were a Christian, you had that, and I was like, okay. Mm -hmm. But that, you, hey, you gotta do what you gotta do to exactly. get the information you can and extract what you can. Right. Um, and so he gave me enough factual information for my time with him to be useful. Yes. And he also gave me a, an entree into the community, which we'll see a little more about momentarily. So this, um, this is a card. Um, you can see that, well you can't see, but this is a card and it's basically like an insurance card. People take out insurance policies for the, um, for death because a lot of people just can't afford it, right? Burial insurance. Burial insurance, basically. So he made it up. He came up with this burial insurance policy for people in this community. The, one of the interesting things is outside of the casket and the car that they rent, I noticed that he had one bottle of cognac that was ordered, and I was like, cognac? So tell me a little bit about the cognac. And he said, well, it's, it's inappropriate to pay someone money to dig a grave for you, so you pay them with a gift. And so often that gift will be a bottle of cognac or a bottle of some sort of alcohol. Okay, so um, this is one of the cars that he had, and very important to have a reliable car. So he had he had very re reliable vehicles. Um, he is able to move through the stop points because the, all the soldiers know him, you know, because it's kind of militarized. So there's uh, movement between the there's a sort of control of movement between areas, and um, they know him, so they just wave him on through. Right, um, which also gives him another leg up in his business. So he, you know his reputation is well is very well known. So um, at the funeral, um, sorry, I'm going to wrap it up because I know that my time is coming. Oh. <laughs> Well, I still want to be do my out and be responsible, as, as responsible as I can. I think I'm already running over. So um, this was the church where the funeral took place, and I arrived there. There had to be about 300 people there for the funeral, and they're all wearing this really beautiful um, black and white fabric, right? This really beautiful black and white fabric, um, and it's my understanding that that is the traditional funerary fabric. But again, I have to 
I, this research was also done through a translator. So the guy barely spoke English. I spoke no Dutch or Surmakan or Sunantango or any of the other dialects. On, so it was like I had to like, you know, get in where I could fit in, get other research documents. Like, it's it's definitely an exciting adventure, but um, I'm still figuring out what's up with the fabric. Um, so you, as you can see, there's this fabric covering the casket, and the casket is loaded onto this sort of apparatus for carrying. Um, the fabric. At the top, it has applique on it, mm -hmm. um, which you know you cut out shapes and then you sew them onto fabric. Mm -hmm. Interestingly enough, also a traditional Beninese mm -hmm. craft. Mm -hmm. So um, that was another place where we could see a connection. Um, everybody was told to wear green, and folks, this is a community where people didn't have a lot. So what people did was wore whatever green they had. One guy had a soccer jersey that was green. Another guy had a pair of flip-flops with green on it. I mean, the people really did their best to do what they could to comply with the wishes of the family. So they carry this um, coffin, which is about a mile, right? Wow. They carry this coffin as a mile, through a mile. Why? Because you have to have a processional. Funerary processional tradition is also very important in Haiti in um, Benin, and we see it in New Orleans, mm -hmm. right? But that, but Benin is the origin of much of that, and obviously we go back even further, right? We go back even further, um, because I know that there, I haven't talked a lot about processionals in Kemet yet, but um, obviously they've done them, right? They, that was an element. Um, so folks came, they also, the family also makes these flags, all of the applique that is made is made by women in the family and they take great pride in this craft. Um, so they, the women walk ahead and they wave these flags sort of heralding the arrival of this new, of this soul who has passed. Um, everybody, just as in Benin, the family will pick a fabric. So you'll be able to pick out the fab family from the rest of the group by their particular fabric. And it's my understanding that this was the family fabric selection, the yellow. Um, so the brothers, they walk down the street with this casket, and then next thing you know, they turn around and they start walking in circles and walking backwards and walking forwards and spinning around. So I asked, well, what are they doing? And the guy said, well, you know, it's believed that the deceased sometimes does not want to be buried. And so he'll make the men turn around in the circles and walk back from the forest. And that's also something that's been documented as being done throughout the diaspora. So um, they actually end up walking the coffin down through the um, through the living quarters of where everyone lives. So this is down sort of the middle of the street. Um, in other diasporic communities, um, people would take the coffin down into the quarters where people lived, uh, where enslaved people lived, and folks would make amends with the coffin. Mm -hmm. So people would actually talk to the coffin, mm -hmm. say, you owe me some money, or I'm sorry for doing this, or whatnot. So the coffin, they would take the coffin on its rounds and allow it to um, make amends with people. Mm -hmm. and, um, so this is part and parcel of the same tradition. So they bring in the cough, the casket bag, and it was also very interesting that on the way from the church, they're singing these very like high-pitched, nasally Christian songs. But when they got down to the main street, um, where other parts of the family were, and that was the road to the burial site, they started like clapping and singing. It was like this rhythmic, very African so songs. So um, again. When I go back, which I will be, I'm going to do more like video recording so we can capture the songs wow. and actually like witness. Everybody can be bear witness to the phenomenon, but this was like so chaotic um, in trying to capture this footage that I couldn't. But that was one thing that definitely stood out for me. The other thing that was interesting is that we know that when we mourn, we mourn together. We mourn very openly. We wail. We fall out. We cry. We do all those things as an effort towards release. Some people call it theatrics, but you know, so, but really, you know, people are releasing that energy. And um, here, the people who would wail, cry, fall out, they would get kicked out of the church. So their time, um, because again, this was a Christian community. Um, this, this, at this time, the family members were wailing and falling out and crying, and they were, it was more of a supportive experience. 
So um, this is just an image of all the people who are coming from the funeral and who are walking to the burial site. And it's pretty much something that the entire community participated in. Um, they're still carrying the coffin. And I was tired just walking, and I didn't have a coffin on my shoulder. But they actually had backup pallbearers. Right. So people, they would switch. You know, people would switch off. But it was very seamless. You didn't really see it happen. Um, this was a truck. They loaded the coffin onto a truck and drove it further into the woods. And, um, and then everybody just walked with it. So you can see us starting on this road into the woods and you can't really see it here but we were really in the heart of the woods and it was so beautiful you know when we were there I'm like this is where we're supposed to be buried you know because it was really right in the heart of nature so you know we're sort of walking through walking up hills crossing little bridges and things we pass by a big old pile of um, boards it's my understanding, um, based on what I could understand from the funeral director, that when uh, when someone is buried, there's a t two chamber um, hole built. So there's a burial chamber that's built with one space for the deceased to rest and another one for them to hang out, like a living room, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And they put additional possessions in there. <coughs> Sound familiar? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So. Um, you know, again, they're still waving the flags on their way to the um, cemetery, but you can see a couple of grave markers just sort of uh, encapsulated in the trees. Uh-oh, I'm getting eyebrows from time. Okay, so now mourners on the side of the grave, um, and you know, just very interesting faces. Um, they lower the casket into the grave. They keep the covering on it, um, which is important. Um, they throw the flowers down onto the casket and then they cover it with another fabric. And in my next, in my future research, I'll have to find out what each of these layers of fabric represent and what they say. Um, but the other thing that was striking is that the family helps to cover up the coffin. So everyone comes, starting with the closest family members, and they put um, dirt on the casket. So they all help to cover up the coffin. And then everyone sort of just takes a turn. There was no jostling or tussling. There was no, there was just no mess. It was all very beautiful, but well understood and well understood process. Um, and then everyone from the community came to help. And these were just a couple of other graves that were in the area. So when I'm traveling and I'm studying about funerals, this is what I'm doing. Um, I'll continue to share my research, both from Haiti, from Benin, even from um, the U.S., just so you get a clear picture of um, what I'm working on. So I get in the practice of sharing more. service for the litany. And as we prepare for our hearts for litany this morning, I have a reading from a book that was actually given to me by my brother back in 1969 or 71. I have this book, The Prophet, all these years, and it looks in pretty good condition. Yeah. And it goes like this. Then said a rich man, speak to us of giving. And he answered, you give but little when you give of your possessions. It is when you give of yourself that you truly give. For what are your possessions but things you keep and guard for fear that you may need them tomorrow? 
And tomorrow, what shall tomorrow bring to the overprudent dog bearing bones in the trackless sand as he follows the pilgrims to the holy city? And what is fear of need but need itself? Is not dread of thirst when your well is full, the thirst that is unquenchable? There are those who give little of the much which they have, and they give it for recognition, and their hidden desire makes their, their gifts unwholesome. And there are those who have little and give it all. These are the believers in life and the bounty of life, and their coffer is never empty. There are those who give with joy, and that joy is their reward. And there are those who give with pain, and that pain is their baptism. And there are those who give and know not pain in giving, nor do they seek joy, nor give with mindfulness of virtue. They give as in yonder valley the myrtle breathes its fragrance into space. Through the hands of such as these, God speaks. And from behind their eyes, he smiles upon the earth. It is well to be given to, to give when asked, but it is better to give unasked through understanding. Ashe. So everyone should have a litany. Uh, placards, or there is a page, page in 16, the, page 16, 16 in the book. In the book in the worship companion. Oh, in the black binder. Somebody at the altar, thank you. Katabazi's at the altar. Tayamba is playing beautifully. Okay, all you just say 15. 15. 15 or 16? 15. 15. So we all stand. As soon as everybody gets still page to read the placard and our little Julia is circulating the basket for envelopes. Our little lovely Julia in her red dress. Don't we? Everybody ready? We read together. Save us, O Holy One, by your name. Vindicate us by your might. Hear my prayer, divine protector. Listen to the words of my mouth. How can we pay the Holy One for the gifts that have been given to us? We will lift up the cup of salvation and call upon God in our hands. We will fulfill our vows to our Creator in the presence of all our people, glad that we bring our sacrifices to you. We will praise your name, O Allah, for it is good. Gumoja, unity. We shall strive to maintain unity in the family, community, nation, and race. We shall self-determination. We shall define and create. Ujima, collective work and responsibility. We shall build and maintain our community get together. Our brothers and sisters' problems shall be ours to solve together. Nia, purpose. We shall make our collective vocation the building and development of our community and the restoration of our people to our traditional greatness. Creativity. We shall do as much as we can and in the way we can to leave our community more beautiful and beneficial than when we inherited. Imani, faith. We shall believe all our hearts and our creator, our people, and the righteousness and victory of our struggle. struggle. for the one who wants to come to the altar.
offered, sacrificed, given with open hearts today. May every cent, every dollar, everything given today, all the energy, all the time, all the work that we put in to what goes on here at Wilson, go to keeping this community vibrant, alive, growing, manifesting what our ancestors would want us to manifest as we fill big shoes, real big shoes of our ancestors. And we need to realize that we have so much abundance. We live in great abundance and we need to do more with the abundance we have. Tell you 
Good morning, we'll say. Good morning. Good morning. Okay, I think I know everybody here. My name is May New MP. Professor May New for short. Good to see you all this uh, I would say afternoon now. I have the uh, pleasure of kind of sharing with you uh, just a little bit of my field research which I've done in the past. But I wanted to I was thinking about what might be relevant, something that might uh, get you a little bit excited this morning, something that might juice you up because I cover a lot of topics in my classes at Contra Costa College and uh, I figure some might not be as interesting to you but we do give uh, insight about things that people have general knowledge about because we know October some people are celebrating different things that we discuss. Uh, what are some of the holidays in October? Halloween. Okay. Well, <laughs> other than Day Halloween? Okay and what else? The Dia de los Muertos, yeah, yeah, that one. 
What's the month-long celebration that ended October 15th, from September 15th to October 15th? Oh, that one? <laughs> uh, it's Hispanic Heritage Month, some call it Latino Heritage Month. Some people are still confused with Columbus Day. Uh, he didn't discover America, America discovered him, lost, washed up, confused, disoriented, and hungry. Uh, so, uh, Jamestown was in May of 1607. But, um, so, you know, those things come up, and then next month is Thanksgiving uh, that comes up. But I figured that it might be, it might be best just to kind of share with you some of the information in the emerging field of what I call Cushology. So there's very few people in the world that have looked beyond Kemet, which is a critical subject that still has to be addressed, to look further up south, to look at Nubiology. There's very few Nubiologists who even attempt to, to address the information in that field, and, and even fewer people that deal with Cushology. In fact, that even sounds strange. It is so new. So I've been doing field work in Sudan for a number of years, independent research that has nothing to do with the college or anybody else telling me what to do, where to go, or how to interpret the research. So I just want to briefly mention the historical significance of Kush, and I know that uh, some of you were at the presentation I did at, at the East Bay Church a few months ago, but I was going to share with you uh, some of the confusion in, the, in this subject as well. And as most of you probably know, South Sudan is the newest country in the world. They voted in 2011 to become a new country. So all of the maps basically are inaccurate because now we have Sudan and then South Sudan. And I've been going because of the, um, I started to look at the pyramid sites, temple sites, tomb sites, and ancient residential sites, but there have been a number of dams that have been uh, proposed. In fact, a couple have been constructed that will flood this important area. This is my colleague, uh, Sorowa, who's, who's actually there now, uh, kind of preparing for our next field research. He's there to help pave the way. And um, as you know, or if not, but the classical African civilizations in this order, Kush, and then Nubia, and then Kemet. And we have to understand it in that, in, in that historical context, otherwise we'll get confused. People think the, the last was first, and the first was last, and it's total confusion. So we know that it's different because of the archaeological and linguistic record. So these are the classical African civilizations that I, that I think are crucial that we embrace. Kush produced Nubia, and Nubia was, was before and helped produce the Kip civilization in Kemet. And there's different reasons why Kush is important, but it's really the first established government on record, really, the first uh, organized state. And the further we go back, Kush seems to be ready-made. So this is what draws me and a few other people to Sudan because of the great development. And um, there's a lot of the archaeological sites that little or no work has been done. So it's really an emerging field. So what we can tell, this is like a general historical outline of Kush, that we know that there are settlements that go back about 70,000 years, ancient settlements. Uh, during the Stone Age period. Stone Age doesn't mean backward. It simply means that they were primarily building in stone. In fact, every monument that was built to, to, uh, to defy time was built in stone. So there's nothing backward about building in stone, whether it's gray whack, whether it's granite, whether it's basalt, limestone. There's nothing more beautiful than alabaster. So they were master stone builders, uh, builders in stone. Then we have early kingship that we can identify going back about 15,000 years. So it's a lot of development in the area. Most times, however, people skip these early periods of ancient Kush and they deal only with the 25th dynasty, the so-called black pharaohs in quotations, and then the Meroitic period. But long before that, you have these other periods. So this is, what, this is the outline I'm working on based on the work. So there's been African-American historians who address Kush, such as um, Priscilla Yusin, in her classic work, The Wonderful Ethiopians of the Ancient Kushite Empire. George, uh, uh, John G. Jackson, Ethiopian, The Origin of Civilization. Then there's uh, William Leo Hansberry. And one thing about it is that the word Kush was changed to Ethiopia. So when you see Ethiopia, people mean Kush in antiquity. So uh, Drusilla Houston, uh, working out of Oklahoma, she worked, wow. she published her classic work back in 1926. Oh. And um, she challenged people to look beyond the current propaganda 
that was uh, was was a preeminent in not only the early 20th century but it continues now. And then book two was also discovered uh, a few years ago. So there's book two. She indicates that there were several books that she had already completed. This one was just discovered just a few years ago uh, wow. by Brooks. Um, so that's important information is book two, Origin of Civilization from the Kushites. So Drusilla Yusuf was definitely on the case uh, close to a century ago. And this is what she said, I know it's too small for you to read, but she said the chapters of this book prove the Kushite race to have been the fountainhead of civilization. If you desire truth, if you desire to be fair-minded, to be educated in the vital knowledge that not possessed by the average college student, mm -hmm. if you desire to be an authority upon the life of the ancients, go down with me as archaeology, ethnology, geology, and philology disclose. Mm -hmm. So she's challenging people 100 years ago. She also uh, goes on to say, I have dug up an irrefutable arsenal of facts that Harvard or Yale or cowardly scholarship in our race dare not refute. How can a leadership point the way that is utterly ignorant of the past. Mm -hmm. So she's challenging those wow. cowards who won't go wow. beyond slavery. Mm -hmm. and by the way, that's that's what's allowed. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a degree in African American studies. What's allowed is that you can address slavery. You can even address the resistance to slavery, but you're not allowed to go beyond that. What? So it's a oh yeah, it's a barrier. Yeah. You 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 would not be allowed to to go across the Atlantic. You can't embrace Africa. If not, if you try to, then you will not be finishing your your dissertation or your mm -hmm. thesis. Mm -hmm. if, if you want to do that, go somewhere else. But we would allow you to address slavery. You can address slave rebellion yeah. as long as it's a negative topic in general. Mm -hmm. Slavery. You're not going to talk about independent African nothing. Mm -hmm. If not, go somewhere else. And those who don't know that, when they go to UC Berkeley, they're yeah. destroyed. Yeah. There's been nobody that looks like us that has gotten a degree, a master's or a PhD at Berkeley in Near Eastern Studies, Egyptology. They don't allow that. And I can tell you one person after another after another who get beat up and destroyed at places like UC Berkeley. That's not exclusive. I mentioned that because it's local. Yeah. The last student who went, pretty sharp student, she took the class with me on, uh, on, on ancient African civilizations. And she went with me to Kennett, very serious young lady. And she changed her majors four times at Berkeley because uh, she had no idea what she was up against. Yeah. Those people are absolutely fierce. And they, it's a... It's a all boys or well, some girls involved with this club that would not allow people that don't look like them and bow down to their conclusions. These people, when they're in the academy, it is uh, it is it, it is it's rote memory. You're not going to say anything outside of what the academy endorses. Yeah, and I am making a journal statement because I've been in the field for a quarter century. And I can talk to you about the people that I've met and spent time with in London or Toronto and Baltimore in Boston and all these different places and here in locally it's the same conclusion. So anyway, she's challenging cowardly scholarship to go beyond what has been defined for us. So even though my degree is in African American stu studies, I learned the tools and techniques of primary research and used the training, the tools and techniques to apply to an independent African analysis, which is not the intent. So, so I beat the odds. <laughs> I came out relatively unscathed. <laughs> You're going to get some scars, but I came out relatively unscathed. So we got the great John Jackson in his pamphlet, Ethiopia and the Origin of Civilization. This is a classic. And so you have people that have been writing about Kush for a while, the great William Leo Hansberry, who set up the African um, division of the history department at Howard University back in 1922. He was ridiculed across the campus. In fact, he was never acknowledged by the uh, establishment in Howard until after he passed. He was acknowledged by his students 50 years later. Chancellor Williams and others, they acknowledged the great William Leo Hansberry 50 years after he founded the African Civilization Section. That was in 1972, 50 years after he had founded this African uh, Studies Section of the History Department. And that's when Howard got on board to rubber stamp what the students organized because that, at that point the great uh, Hansberry had passed away and he was no longer a physical threat. Mm -hmm. yeah. That was in the 70s, but they ridiculed the man. He never published. Yeah. He never published. He did pioneering work in London, he, uh, I mean, sorry, in the UK, particularly at Oxford. He did extensive re research in Africa, but he never published his work. His students tried to get Hansberry to publish, but he never did. 
So with this, these works, the William Leo Hansberry African History Notebook, Volumes 1 and 2, mm -hmm. they were actually edited and published by one of his students, Joseph Harris, mm -hmm. years later. And, uh, but the man received a lot of ridicule during his day. Now, what do the Greek writers have to say about Cush? Okay, I'm glad you asked. Let's answer that, <laughs> that question. So here's how Cush became Ethiopian. So we know about the Hebrew Bible. In the Hebrew Bible, there's Cush spelled with a K, sometimes a C. So you have Cush or, or Cushite when it's translated into Greek. So, in, so the Greeks, they changed Cush or Cushite into, not sure why, but Ethiopia with an A-E. And this means burnt face, black face, or kissed by the sun. So clearly they were struck by color. So they didn't continue to use Cush, whether it's a C or a K. The Greeks changed it to Ethiopia and Ethiopian. And then later when it gets to the King James Version, they dropped the A. And it becomes Ethiopia without the A and Ethiopian. And that's how it goes from Cush, the Hebrew version, to the Greek, and then to the modern English version. But uh, that's what the Greeks did, and they started this shift from uh, calling people Kush to Ethiopian. So that's so it really means a man or woman with a sun with a sunburnt complexion, or kissed by the sun, something like that. Anyway, so the Kush, the Greeks had the highest respect for the Kushites, uh, and one record after another yeah. is the same thing. It's the same conclusion. There's no Greek writer that said anything negative about the Kushites. So this is the ancient model before it turned into the Aryan model a couple hundred years ago when white supremacist scholars from Germany changed the historical record. But before that, this is what the Greeks said. Now, Homer is important because he wrote the first two books in the history of Europe, the Odyssey and the Iliad. This is what he says. I must tell you, Zeus, who is Zeus? The king of the gods. King of the gods among the Greeks, exactly. He left to join the blameless Ethiopians. Blameless in what matter? In conduct, in character. He went to join the blameless Ethiopians at a banquet, and all the good, uh, the gods went with him. But in 12 days' time, he would be back on Mount Olympus. That's where supposedly Zeus and the other Greeks live. This is important. So not so. Look, if you in, if you're in control, you invite people to your place. If somebody's going to have a meeting with Obama, he doesn't come visit you. You go visit him because he's the president. He's the central figure here. So why is the king of the Greek gods leaving Mount Olympus to go join the blameless Ethiopians? Because of their authority. Because of the high level of respect. He leaves and brings his entourage with him to meet with the Ethiopians for 12 days. This is very significant. This is extremely significant. So Homer is the first one who shows this kind of respect and all the Greek writers follow. Every single one in Herodotus. Notice what he's supposedly the father of history. Let's correct it. The father of European history. Herodotus says the Ethiopians are said to be the tallest and the best looking people in the world. Now typically people would call themselves the best looking and the greatest and the best of the best. But the Greeks didn't. They felt that the Ethiopians were better looking than they were. And so Herodotus says that this is what the Greeks considered uh, uh, among the Ethiopians. Also the contributions of those from Ethiopia, even Lucian. He talks about the Ethiopians who invented the science of the stars and gave names to the planets. He's indicating that the Ethiopians invented what? Astrology and astronomy. These are Greek writers, unedited, that did their words, and, uh, and that they passed this to the, the people in Kemet. That's Lucian. What about Diodorus? Diodorus indicates that, that the Greek historians said that the people of Cush or Ethiopia were the first of all men. And not only that, but they're the ones that introduced uh, the people how to honor the gods, sacrifices, uh, processions, and festivals, and other rites by which men and women honor the gods. This is very important. And then he goes on to say that it passes on to the people in Kemet. And this is not the only source. There's different sources of information, whether it's archaeology, whether it's the written records from, from, uh, from Kemet, or Greek sources. It doesn't matter. They all, or the biblical record. They all go back to Cush becoming first. And of course, as you all know, the great Chancellor yes. Williams, who was a student of Hansberry, one of the pioneers in the field. So Chancellor Williams, based on his extensive research, uh, in 26 different countries. This is the map he came up with. I was inspired when I saw this some years ago because Chancellor Williams is one of the few that put together what I believe to be a fairly accurate map of ancient. Notice he doesn't mention Ethiopia, um, Kush, but he calls it Ethiopia following the Greek tradition. So he says all of this is the Ethiopian Empire and the southern part is Nubia and notice the northern part is Kem or Kemet. This is a very good understanding that 
that all of this was Cush at one point, and then Nubia emerged, and then later on Kemet. So it's important to know that. Uh, based on the additional work I've done, this is a map of Cush that I put together that I know that we have archaeological and linguistic records. So the heartland of Cush was in current day Sudan. That's where the government was located. That's where the elaborate temples are located in Sudan. But it wasn't just located there. It's also in current day Egypt in Djibouti, in Somali, in Eritrea, in Ethiopia, <coughs> all these places. And now we can say southern Sudan, but it also extended across the Red Sea into Saudi Arabia and Yemen. Mm -hmm. And this is all a part of the ancient Kushite Empire before the emergence of Nubia and Kemet. And um, so this is what Chancellor Williams said, this is the greatest of all of the issues. That it goes so far back into antiquity that this knowledge is beyond the reach of man. In other words, right now we have no access to the origins of the civilization. All we know is there's a vast complex that requires extensive ongoing work over the years and decades. So that's what Chancellor Williams understood. And he also calls for field work because this is one of the greatest stories of how such a great civilization is now unknown. So this is one of the tragic human stories. And that's why it's important to read the preview of Dr. Williams' work. Now what do mainstream Egyptologists say about Cush? That's obviously the question. They're confused. They don't know what or where it is. Mm -hmm. So ancient Nubia, one of their best is David O'Connor. And David O'Connor, this is what he says in his book, Ancient, that's always something negative. Ancient Nubia, evil, uh, Egypt's rival in Africa. Why do they have to be fighting all the time? That's the only way they can understand it is conflict. That supposedly the, the, the backward Africans up south they were at odds with the more developed people in, in Egypt. This is how they present the story. Look how crazy this is. He says the new, that the word Nubia and Nubian for the periods covered in this book refer only to geographical locations, not to the ethnicity or language of the people involved. Huh? <laughs> Nubia is a word of uncertain origin. He's confused, to say the least. And then you have people, uh, one guy from the UK, put, he has a documentary on supposedly African civilizations. He said that the word Nubia originally meant slave. Mm. <laughs> Incredible. They just make up wild stories, but they have the press behind them and a the distribution network to mislead the public. So how can Nubia, how can Nubia only refer to a geographical location, not the ethnicity or language? Makes no sense. This is unique in the world. Unique. <laughs> And he goes on to say that uh, that this is that that the that the people and places are often obscure to who to us. They talking about they don't know. So so the people named the entire Nubian nation. So he said, are the people named the entire Nubian nation, or those of a subregion, or even a small village, or is it a single site? He said, we don't know. And yet these are the people who are the so-called authorities that people have so-called study groups around and they read and study this nonsense that if it has some credibility, it does not. It's about publishing books and misleading the public. That's what it's always been. So, so these questions can puzzle, <laughs> can puzzle scholars. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. So in his book, he's, he says all of this is Nubia. Are you kidding me? Uh, Nubia never extended beyond this region here. Mm. Never. All of this could have only been Kush. So the modern Nubian culture never extends beyond here, modern or ancient, but they don't know. So if they don't know, they just gloss over the whole thing and just say, well, they're Nubians. That's like somebody saying, well, you know what, all those people, they're just Africans. But we know that there's different ethnicities, different languages, there's variation among the African uh, continent and the African people, so they don't know. All they know is that we're going to just call this Nubia and just sweep everything else under the rug. Even this here, they're now saying that all of this is Upper Nubia or Kush. How in the world are these interchangeable? But they never have been until modern times. Anyway, let me show you something here. So the Black Pharaohs, this uh, made the front cover of National Geographic February 2008. And this is totally misleading. Why is anybody talking about the Black Pharaohs? No one talks about the white kings of Greece. It's assumed. It's assumed that they're white. No one talks about the white rulers of Rome. It's assumed. But they say the Black Pharaohs because they only want to say that the Black Pharaohs were the ones in the 25th 25th dynasty, the late period, not the early period. The early period were non-black pharaohs. And that term is uh, was coined by Robert Moorcock some years earlier. And this is his book, The Black Pharaohs, Egypt's Nubian Rulers. Well, first of all, the 25th dynasty are not Nubians. They're from Cush. The record clearly indicates they're from Cush. And here's Moorcock, very happy that he's selling uh, <laughs> his book. <laughs> 
And, and strange fellow, I spent time when I lived in London during this time period. Uh, they have a lot of meetings that are never recorded, never documented. And so Robert wasn't going to give up all the details. But one of uh, one of the PhD students kind of blew their cover, telling me all of the things that they talk about that they agree to behind doors. So Robert would show up at the at the library. She said, "Oh, hey, I'm going to talk to you, Robert." Uh, Robert tell me knew about this if and Robert said, Hey, look, we ain't discussing that. <laughs> so he made sure that there was never any uh divulging of what they talked about behind closed doors. She was very naive to think that this man's gonna give up any secrets. So he would talk in general, we went to lunch, but not about what they agreed to behind closed doors. So clearly these are powerful pharaohs and rulers, but they come from a long tradition. They don't just pop up in the eighth century before the common era. Uh, the uh, so-called black pharaohs, well, they all are African. So what's, what is, uh, no one talks about the wet rain. We know by definition that the rain is wet, so why repeat? That's like somebody talking about the Sahara Desert. By definition, the Sahara means desert in Arabic, so why is there one repeat? Makes us the black pharaohs. And this is silly, uh, but it's also propaganda as well. But there's no doubt that they were powerful, and they built these kind of monuments using basalt. Um, and uh, I'm sorry, you, you, I'm sorry, using granite, excuse me, using granite, because they were meant to last. Mm -hmm. So it's clearly uh, a face of African rulership. But I want to show you some, and this is, this is in a place called Kerma, where they found this, this cachet some years ago in uh, Bonnet from Swiss, from Switzerland. He started using this term, the black pharaohs, like Robert Moorcott, and that's when it really caught on about 2003. That's when the public started hearing about these alleged so-called black pharaohs. They're, no doubt they're powerful. These are pyramid builders. They have elaborate temples and elaborate tombs. It's an extraordinary period of development. There's no question about that. One ruler after another after another that united the entire Nile Valley. This is not the first time they're going down north in the Kemet. They're trying to reunite the old Kushite Empire. That's what their motivation was. They're not entering and, 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 uh, and invading Egypt. Uh, as some backward Africans, as people try to make it seem. And the greatest of all the builders of Kush, uh, of Kush is Taharqa. He's the most prolific of all of the builders. Uh, you have many of the leaders. A lot of, uh, I, I joke with people, if you really want to know about Kush, you have to go to the Boston Museum of Fine Arts because that's where the images are. So you want to know about Kush? You, you go to Boston. That's where the theft, <laughs> uh, now there's other collections that have stolen uh, columns from temples, you have uh, Asfelta, Admalani, Queens. Look at the screen here, give you an idea of all the theft that takes place in the, even here. And this is Asfelta coffin, 13 and a half tons. They had to build a brand new floor just to house the coffin that he was building. So these were major and master builders, to say the least. But their images and their sculpture, statues, things have been stolen. Let me show you something here about their culture and why it's important for us to know more about it. Here's the powerful Asfelta. And you see these plumes here? This is the telltale sign of a Kushite king. Mm -hmm. This is not Nubian, this is Kush. Mm -hmm. And Asfelta, being a powerful ruler, here is this coronation steel. This is, this is the, the inscription indicating and describing how he became king. And he became king like the other rulers from Kush. They only became king when their mothers oversaw the ceremony. So with uh, Asfelta, Taharka, I mean, they had to send hundreds of miles to the south for their mothers to come in an entourage to preside over the ceremony. So what you have here is, uh, this is Asfelta. He's kneeling down because he's receiving what? His crown. This is, this is Amen, and this is his wife, Moot. So you have Amen and Moot, and then you have Asfelta being coronated. And, but here's his mother. Mm -hmm. as uh, uh, Nasalsa. His mother is holding two cisterns. The cisterns are the sacred rattlers that are only really used and rattled by women. I've seen one example to the contrary where you had a male priest holding the cistern, but that's very rare. But here she is presiding over the ceremony. So it's interesting that in many cases they don't mention the fathers. It's not like the day when fathers run off. I'm not saying that. <laughs> and, don't, and don't be providers. But the mothers were more important than the fathers, because that's who they mentioned, that's who they show, that's who, who's over the ceremony, because the, the, the crown was passed on the female line, from mother to daughter, so that's what happens here, so he's receiving this crown 
from his mother. And uh, you have any, you know, high images of, of queens and goddesses. And these are Kushite princes. Sometimes you'll see t-shirts or bags yeah. or misleading websites saying these are Nubian. No, they're not Nubian. It's a difference. They're Kushites. You said the plumes, we can tell that they're Kushites? Uh, yeah, when you see the plumes, that's, that's uh, those kind of plumes, that's from Kush. That's from the south. Here you have princes, you see their crowns here. Notice the black and brown skin tone from the past, but also the present. You look in Sudan, the indigenous unmixed folks who have not come in in recent times, this is how they look even today uh, among the people of Sudan. Look at the beautiful images, so you have Nebu meaning gold, the rings of gold, and today in Sudan there's literally a gold rush. There's a gold rush in northern Sudan. Every site you go to, it's kind of interesting, is that part of the archaeological site or is that a mining camp? A lot of times you see the mining camp before you can even get to the site. People want people from the U.S., from Europe to bring some kind of gold scanning equipment. Wow. I said, I told my colleague, I said, colleague, let me tell you something. I live in California, and there was a gold rush about 150 years ago. And most of the people who came to California, they never went back with anything. They had to stay here because they were broke. <laughs> so all this stuff about somebody striking it rich is usually probably, yeah, but I heard about this story. Yeah, you know what? You heard about that story. What about the other 10 and 15 and other 20 stories? We hear about people uh, winning the lotto. How often does that happen? Not very, so I said be careful. And uh, But people are just everywhere searching for gold. So anyway, you have beautiful artifacts. Let me get to something else. The Barrowitty script hasn't been translated yet. Uh, we can make the symbols out, but in terms of reading sentences, really hasn't been done yet. The Rosetta Stone helped the scholars and linguists to crack the code of, of hieroglyphics of men of nature in Kemet. But Barrowitty script is not entirely known. We have beautiful artifacts. The animals, the black top pottery, which is throughout the Nile Valley. It's a common culture. One of the things that separates one group from another is, is pot is pots. But here you can't tell the difference between these these pots, whether it's in Kush, Nubia, or further down north in Kim. It's the same. And they and so the black that's a, a telltale sound sign of a united Nile Valley culture. Uh, there were some differences but similarities. Now regarding pyramids, we know that there were a little over 111 or so pyramids in Kemet, and these are the monuments that confound the world. So we know about the pyramids in Kemet, but people don't know there's twice as many pyramids further south in Sudan. So let me show, and these, but by the way, are people. I know you can't see them, but that's the point I'm making. They're totally irrelevant in this image. So these monuments were built to uh, built for eternity. But as we go further south, there's there's major pyramid fields in Sudan, Kushite. Pyramids, like at places like Nuri. There's about 223 or so pyramids in Sudan. There's pyramids in Nuri. Hardly anybody goes. You might see a camel train coming through, but it's not a tourist site because it's difficult to get there. It's not a tourist country because the British destroyed Sudan. Yeah. The infrastructure doesn't really exist. Um, and you've got back Berwia. Some say this is Meru. It's not Meru. It's near Meru. Um, so you got a pyramid field here, pyramids built for kings, queens, and high officials. So you got a lot of pyramids in the area. No one really travels to the area. It's amazing. You have such extraordinary culture that is not even looked at. And then, so you have destruction by Ferlini as well as George Reisner looking for gold. They didn't find it, but they surely did destroy a lot of monuments. And you have chapels in front of the pyramids in this location. Uh, here's some of the excavation in the early 1920s looking for gold. They were not successful. There's a Jebel Barkel, one of the sacred sites here, um, and they believed that, that Amun was a part of the whole mountain structure there. Uh, if we had time, I would say more, but this is an important pyramid site here, as well as uh, uh, interrelated temples. Mm -hmm. And whenever you have a pyramid, it's a pyramid complex for interrelated buildings. Now, um, at El Kuru, there's pyramids and there's burials underneath. There's burials underneath, so you have some of the beautiful art, like uh, Tanutamani, he's buried right next to his mother, Kalhalta. There's no burial of his father, but he's buried right next to his mother. And at that site, here he is, uh, Tanutamani uh, being led by a deity into his burial chamber. So it's a beautiful scene. And what the Kushites said, they have not one Uranus, <coughs> but two. That's also one of the signs of a Kushite headdress. And then you have the glyphs here, so he's being led 
uh, to the burial, and these are the stars because it's about ascension. Not that somebody's dead, no, they're ascending, and he's ascending uh, to become among the stars. But let me show you something here. So in January, I went to a lot of these different sites here, these uh, Kushite archaeologists. The ones in the north are Nubian, but the ones in the south here, these are Kushite uh, sites. But let me just point out Sadinga and a couple of these, these sites here. So when I was in Sudan, uh, Derek Wellsby, he's the keeper at the British Museum. He's over the, um, the artifacts in the collection dealing with ancient Kush, Nubia, and also Egypt. So they have a new <coughs> organization of the artifacts. So Derek Wellsby, he gave a presentation in December of last year, and his presentation was interesting. It was entitled The Pyramids of Kush at the Greek, a Greek Athletic Club. So I went to that, right? It was the day before we went out in the field. So Derek Wellsby is supposed to be some giant among mainstream writers, and he's written books like The Kingdom of Kush, Nubia, and Sudan Ancient Treasures, and people actually are, are wasting their time from taking all of this serious. I think the pictures are the best thing that you can get from <laughs> it, but the interpretation is highly suspect. Mm -hmm. He doesn't know what he's talking about. Let me give you an example. Derek Wellsby, I've taken notes there, and he's talking about the pyramids of Kush, and we were about to go out in the field the very next morning. He said something extraordinary. He said that there were hundreds. He said there were literally hundreds of pyramids at Sedin. Hundreds. <laughs> so I tapped my buddy and said, this is totally impossible. There's only a, a little over 200 in the entire country. How can one site have hundreds? So he said this on, uh, on this day. So that was our joke throughout the entire tour. Every time we went to Sedinga or talked to the local people, we were saying that this, uh, this guy from London was saying there were hundreds of pyramids, and people would be looking around because there were no pyramids in Sedinga. You know, so, okay, so here's, here's what I did to show that this guy does not know what he's talking about, but yet he is among the best of the best. And quite arrogant, I might add, because doing the question and answer, um, this outrageous responses. So. It's interesting because later on, I, uh, I did a talk at Contra Costa, and I mentioned this in passing about some uh, crazy, so somebody arguing that there are pyramids in Sedinga, and a student showed me something. He came to my office and showed me some YouTube clip, which I'll show you as I end, that there were pyramids in Sedinga. So I found this article, which the YouTube, uh, which the YouTube clip references, and supposedly there are 35 pyramids in Sedinga. And um, this is the, the area here. <laughs> so these are not pyramids. Mm. We comb the area, and trust me, uh, it wouldn't take long for even the, the most lay person among us to tell the difference between a tomb made out of mud brick and a pyramid. Pyramids are not hard to spot. So we're looking and we're joking about where are the pyramids in Sedinga. So when I came back, I found this news story which was published in February. So, uh, but anyway, let me show you what he, the Welshman says there were pyramids at hundreds in Sedinga. <laughs> and he says there were hundreds, and he said there were, there were pyramids in Kawa. So we had a chance to go to Kawa, and trust me, it's hard to find these sites because number one, there's no roads, there's no asphalt, as they call it. There, and there's no signs, and there's no elaborate structures. The structures are, are not even as high as, as, this, as, as this ceiling in most no. cases. So it's very difficult to find anything there. But anyway, so let me uh, point out to you Sedinga. So this is part of Sedinga here. These are tombs. Mm -hmm. These are not and never were pyramids. So I was trying to figure out why is this man, because obviously there's no pyramids there, what's the motive to claim that there's pyramids? I, didn't, I couldn't figure it out at first, but I'll tell you how I came to the understanding of why people promote this pyramid. Uh, scheme, because that's all it is. <laughs> and so you got nothing but pyramids. There's no pyramids here. Mm -hmm. These are not pyramids. You don't have a dugout in the middle of a pyramid. These are tombs. They've excavated tombs. The French have. And so this is all something. These are tombs. There are no pyramids here. As a matter of fact, you can see the burial areas. So there's no question whatsoever. So here's the deal. I knew that, that uh, this was kind of shaky. So I said, let me contact this great researcher and see what he has to say about these hundreds of pyramids in Sedinga because we didn't find one. 
So uh, I, <laughs> I emailed him and I asked him about his talk at the, about the pyramids of Kush. And I pretty much I asked him, uh, what is your count of the total number of pyramids in Sudan? But more specifically, how many pyramids did you say are located at Sudan? And he said hundreds. I wanted to keep it general and see what his response was. So I sent him an email. Uh, and then uh, this is his response. Show you the strange way in which these people go about their business. This great scholar said, uh, I do not have a precise number of, uh, for the pyramids, the number of pyramids in Sudan. New pyramids are being discovered every year, particularly at Sedinga, Amarna West, and Kawa. Yeah, right. And also, many square monuments and cemeteries in Farawanic and Kushite dates are impossible to identify with certainty as pyramids. When poorly preserved, they could be the base of, of uh, mastabas or pyramids, impossible to tell. But that's not what he said. He said there were hundreds of pyramids in Sedinga. Now he's backtracking, and he, then he goes on and says that the, then he goes, at Sedinga, the number of pyramids increases every year. <laughs> so he suggests I contact uh, Riley. Yeah, well, why are they increasing? So when I, when I started to figure this out, I recognized what it's about. Do you know that Howard Carter is known to us because he's the one that discovered what famous tomb? Tutankhamen. <laughs> Tutankhamen, 1922. That's Kings Valley Tomb 63. That's the last tomb ever found in the Nile Valley. So if somebody now can find a field of pyramids, do you know what that would do to their career? So I recognize all of the nonsense and the fabrications because the guy is trying to, to elevate his career. Because to find pyramids after all these years, because you know pyramids are astounding monuments. You don't have to go find them. They find you before you can find them. That's how powerful they are. And so uh, that's really what this is about. So um, let me show you a three-minute clip here. Uh, because when, I, when the student showed me this, it's very interesting. I was pointing out the issue. Uh, so there is uh, some of this is on YouTube. And you have these people who are trying to simply take their career to a different level. But uh, I dismissed Wellsby's position because even those who claimed that there were pyramids said there were only how many? They said there was only 35. He said there were hundreds, uh, just talking wildly. So um, this here. <laughs> we've got even more great from the Walmart Ox over Sabre. That's a, obviously. So, all right, this is about two minutes here, and I want to show you. Uh, now, it's kind of like for younger audiences, but it's the most complete so-called uh, presentation on the pyramids in Sedinga, and I think you'll, you'll, you'll see some of the contradictions. So this is a Hank, I guess. I never heard, this is like the side channel. So let's, uh, let's get to the Thank part. Thank you so much to Michael and Emily for filling in while I was gone, but I missed you, and I missed sharing news of the universe with you. So I brought you back something nice from my as it appears to have exaggerated, on February 5th, the Lester team released a 3D reconstruction of the king's face based on the shape of the skull. And it looks pretty normal, not the villainous, deformed monster that Shakespeare described him as being. So thank you, science, for helping us double-check some history. Also last week, another team of archaeologists challenged what we thought we knew with their findings from an excavation in northern Sudan. Between 2009 and 2012, the team, led by Vincent Francini of the American Natural History Museum, found 35 pyramids at a site near the Nile. The 2,000-year-old necropolis called Sedinga was once part of the Kush Kingdom, which thrived in the shadow of ancient Egypt for much of its history. Kush kings actually ruled Egypt for about 100 years in the 8th century BCE, but the rest of the time, we think Kush was basically Egypt's frenemy, borrowing from its traditions and architectural styles. So it may come as no surprise that there are actually lots of pyramids in modern-day Sudan. What's special about these pyramids is that there are so many of them, and they're so not Egyptian. In one section of the new site, roughly the size of a basketball court, there are 13, ranging from just 76 centimeters wide, built for a child, to 6.7 meters. Not only are they much smaller than the wonders of the world that you're familiar with, each pyramid is built around a center circle called a tumulus, which is a Kush style of construction. Only one such pyramid has been found outside of Sedinga, so this discovery gives a little credit to Kush's architectural traditions and not Egypt's for once. Okay, so enough about dead people. How about some chemistry humor? You want to hear a joke about that? Okay, so there's, uh, 
I know that was quick, but obviously there's some problems with this. He says that the, the pyramids range from 76 centimeters? How can a pyramid be 30 inches? See how silly this is? A 30 inch <laughs> pyramid? This is incredible. Or even on the larger end, a, 20, a 22 foot pyramid. This is, uh, this is the kind of nonsense that is out there. And that's like the best you'll get about the so-called documentation. And then notice that how quick it is. You can't even process what they were even showing here uh, because it's, it's meant to be as quick as possible because it's not legitimate. So in other words, before you can really process it, um, like this here. So it's really quick. It's really quick and they move on. These are simply tombs. Anybody can see that walking around the site. But that's what we're dealing with here is people who, uh, who are not interested. So, but even either way, with, with uh, Wellesby, he claimed that, the, uh, that, that there were hundreds, you know, to make it, I guess to make his presentation sound better. And then he backtracks when, uh, when I asked him about it. So that's what we're dealing with here is people who really are not interested in being accurate, but yet people rely on what they have to say. That's the biggest problem. Is people relying on this, this, this kind of nonsense, and that's what's been promoted. These are not pyramids; never, never meant to be uh, pyramids. So anyway, there are there are a number of dams being built. That's what drew me to the area. And if these dams are built, they're going to flood Nubia and the area of uh, of Kush. And so this is why the Save Nubia project is focused on on field research. To, uh, to learn more about this, uh, this site. We, we have made progress in helping to get these uh, identified as World Heritage Sites under threat. And, um, and that has to be an effort that goes through the Sudanese government, through UNESCO, and finally to build several museums in the area. And that's really what our work is. Right now, the, the archaeology is dominated by people like Wellesby. And they are completely outrageous in their claims, but they're not looking to be accurate. What they're looking to do is promote their career. Yes. And if anybody's talking about pyramids in Kawa, are you kidding me? There are no pyramids in Kawa, there are no pyramids in Sudinga, but that's the latest craze. Mm -hmm. That's that's the latest game. Claim a pyramid, get funding. Claim a pyramid uh -huh. and elevate your career be up beyond and above every, any and everybody else. That's what the latest game was. That's why I kind of feel, why would they lie about that? Now it's totally clear. Brother, you want to say? No. Okay. All right. So anyway, um, that's uh, that's our work. We can say more about the archaeological uh, sites, but you know, thank you for your time. I wanted to introduce you to some of the some of the latest stuff regarding Kemen and what uh, Kush that is. Sorry, and what people are promoting now. It's about pyramids here, pyramids there, pyramids everywhere, as opposed to uh, legitimate ongoing field work. And one of the sisters that will be uh, that's done field work, Sister Nubia, says she left one of the sites. Uh, because the work that is done there is not legitimate work. There's people who are tomb robbers, treasure robbers, uh, uh, and treasure hunters. And it's so gross that she said she couldn't even be a part of it, so she left uh, the site with some of these uh, leading archaeologists because it is totally disrespectful to just loot and rob and then uh, try to keep whatever they can and sell it to some museum. Mm -hmm. Can you speak a little bit more about Uh, well, the uh, yeah, the progress with the uh, National Corporations of Antiquities and Museums, or NCAM, that's the organization in Sudan that is over all the archaeological sites. And they're the ones that give pyramids, and Dr. Muhammad is the one that issues those pyramids. I'm sorry, those uh, the issues permits to go to pyramid and other sites. So they want to preserve the sites, but they're part of the government. But NCAM would actually have to make a formal, a formal proposal to be able to present to UNESCO that these sites should be, that they should be preserved. No outside entity can do that. It has to be a government, it has to be a government um, uh, process. So NCAM is the number one organization, and so I had a chance to spend time with the director. And I think I showed a picture before. He has a Save Nubia pin. He has the, the small pocket calendar, the wall calendar. He has the same movie. Every only thing he doesn't have is our T-shirts. When I go back, I, <laughs> I don't know if you're wearing it around. Is he inclined to? He's inclined to. He knows what I'm, what we're saying is correct, but it's all politics too. So he has to really 
do good work and find a way to present this without him or other people. They're not going to lose their job. But I, I, I have a leg up on one of the guys. He's leading tours, and uh, Incam doesn't know about it. So when people go for their archaeological pr uh, permits, he's there siphoning off business <laughs> by leading tours. So he told us, <laughs> shh, don't tell anybody I'm out in the field <laughs> leading these tours. So, uh, so he and I have something to talk about. You don't want people to know what you're doing, and uh, help us out a little bit. So, but Sudan is a, like any government, it's an interesting place, but I, we've made progress. So it, it requires being there as much as possible to continue to cultivate the relationships. Because there's people who do want to save the monuments, but uh, those people who are putting money behind the dams is big business and big interest involved. Yes, for sure. We'll make this the last two. Yes. Oh, yeah, Brother Randu, is there a challenge? Uh, going on among scholars, black scholars, against this whole uh, policy of the universities, specifically University of California, Berkeley, to not allow uh, dissertation, research, and study beyond slavery. No, no, no kind of active campaign. No, but African American studies is only slavery. The other areas, no, they, they, there's no fight. It's just, that's what the academy allows. And you got traditional African-American colleges and universities is the same, it's no different. Whether it's mainstream white institutions or black it's the same. Because that's what the, that's what the field allows, that's what the field is, is focused on. Slavery or even a resistance to it. Is there some kind of way to start that though, to, to, to kind of try and get people together? It has to be the community, the brother Dunn. It, it has to be the whole community. The, the community has to be behind that. Because people going in there as a lone, isolated individual, they don't stand mm -hmm. a chance. And they know that they're that they're that. Well, no doubt, there's people go in for their with their theses and their master's theses or PhD, PhD dissertations. They're alone. There's no way they can go against the academy. So it really would have to be a community issue with uh, extensive research to document this kind of nonsense. But students are not really inclined to do that. If they're not connected to the community, there's no way they can survive. And that's really what what the issue is. Is there a um, discussion among black historians to, to form a unified effort? Yeah. The closest thing you get to it is ASCAC. And, and That's I, have the closest. A on, I have a book on, uh, I think it was Schlesinger, Schlesinger that yeah. white historian, mm -hmm. and he put out a book on uh, uh, land basing uh, scholars that was doing Egyptian work. <coughs> And he sent around to uh, all of the different institutions mm -hmm. saying, don't support me. He mm -hmm. I mean, named all of them, you know, mm -hmm. Alain Karenga, yeah. you yeah. yeah. he named them all of them. He says, you, you got them now, you got So they, what they said they're doing, they're destroying history. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that, yeah, and that, and that, that's where things are at. So that kind of effort would have to come from the community. Individual students are not going to be successful. And they haven't been. I learned that a long time ago from the late great Jacob Carruthers. He told me that that was 15 years ago. Yeah, Sister Ford, then we got to end. I know time is up. Just for clarification, the same movie project is working on both in Sudan and South Sudan? No, no, not, not South Sudan, just Sudan. Yeah, okay. South Sudan is totally different. <laughs> That's a different, yeah, in, just in Sudan. Just in Sudan. Okay, thank you, folks. Uh, we talk about that. Brother Maynou. Uh, if you close out, I'm going to ask you to stand and uh, join us in a circle to close out. Uh, this is an opportunity if you have not joined us in this work and you want to join and recommit yourself to it, um, you can come and be with us. Any quick announcements? And I do mean quick. I look we're over time. But um, any announcements? Anything happening at Eli Omo Day we need to be aware of? Everybody knows about the meeting after we finish? No. Say what it is. Election. No. Not, not election, but uh, nominations. 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 Okay. Is this a plan here to clarify that? No, it is nominations. Right. She'll clarify it okay. once you get your food. All right. Well, with that, uh, mm -hmm. lift every voice and sing. Sister Penny Gatz. Lift every